Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 151 of the Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui, and I'm here with Roger Pang. Good morning. Good morning. Well, other people may be listening to this, who knows, the afternoon, at night. But it, could be, it could be centuries from now. Exactly. Except for the, just like v- vinyl, I guess vinyls come back. There'll have to be some, right? There'll, there'll be some retro technology in order to listen to. It'll be like on wax cylinders or something. Exactly. Yeah, I, I I saw a statistic somewhere that I think vinyl is the only like medium that's actually increasing in sales. Wow. The only like kind of like yeah, I guess medium for music relative to like CDs or I guess relative to CDs really. Well, do you think it's just that we need another like ten years and then CDs will come back? You know what? Like like there's a that the, the calendar time piece has to happen, right? Like the reason vinyl's growing is because. Everything from the 60s and 70s is all that. I predict CDs are never coming back. Okay. Uh, can I tell you why? Why? Have you listened to a CD recently? <laughs> no. They're really bad. At it. It's because um, I have I have a lot of CDs uh, for better or for worse, and um, the you know it's funny because at the time when I bought them, I thought this is like not the audio quality could could not get ever better could never could never get better than this right like this is the peak audio quality right. And like now I listen to it, it's like it's really bad actually. It's compared to like what you might hear on like a streaming service or something like that. You're also more of an audiophile than I am, so <laughs> I take your word for it. So I don't think tapes and uh, CDs they're they're not coming back ever. Oh, the cas- I miss the cassette tape, right? Because, well, tell me whether you experience this or not, because you you may have not, just because our the gap in our age is in the years we were born as such that this may not have been like a major highlight of your teenage years was making the mixtape. Oh yeah. I made mixtapes. You did. And not only that, this is just really embarrassing is sometimes your fit, you would be waiting and listening to the radio nonstop for some song to come on because you would hold up the cassette recorder to the radio <laughs> to record the song. Well, I think I was one step ahead of you, which is that like I had one of those tape recorders that like you could just record it off the radio. Oh, uh, like so if like if you're listening to the radio and you like happen to hit record when the song came on, then it would record it like right. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. that was advanced. Yes, but you still had to like wait around and um, and then hope that it, and then you had to like deal with the DJ like talking at the beginning of the song, <laughs> whatever. Or and then you you sometimes have to try to call the DJ to call in a request. Uh, have, I never did that. <laughs> <laughs> I I did that. I suspected you did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. Well, that's a that kind of intervention is a whole different level, you know. It is. It is. But we really digress. Like yes. eventually, the effort report is not going to be about academia anymore. No. <laughs> it's going to be about the good, the bad old days of audio technology. That's right. That's right. So should we move on to work in progress? Work in progress. What's Europe first? Well, so uh, we have a new listener who she was so excited about discovering the effort report, which was awesome. And she, I think, gave us a shout out and retweeted us. Um, And so now she's listening and she had commentary about um, our episode about search engine optimization. And um, her name's Sapna uh, Kuchadkar, and I'm sure I mispronounced that, and I'm so sorry, Sapna. You can let us know how to correctly pronounce your name. And maybe I'll say what she tweeted, because I think you were the one that brought this up as a topic, because this was not even something that would occur to me, for better or worse. So she says she's going to push back on the follow-up on this episode about search engine optimization, which um, was episode 144. And she said it might seem like overkill to senior and established investigators, which guilty as charged, right? We're senior and established investigators. But she says in the day and age of fire hydrant of publications from a bazillion different journals, SEO matters for those early in career trying to get their work notice. While I agree every single item on the list may not be necessary, paying special attention to keywords in the title and abstract is key, no pun intended. Creating a compelling, accurate, and non-overreaching title for your paper is an important skill, and the SEO tips can help keep things streamlined and broad in reach. And then she goes on to say she looked back at some of the titles from her papers early in her career and think, oh, that could have been a lot better. 
and she advises mentees to think about it as a par- an important part of scientific communication. So that's a that's a summary. My feeling. So I had to like go back and rem- remind myself of what this old article from Wiley was, uh, actually talked about, um, and mostly it talked about like t- you know creating a good title. Optim- it's optimizing your abstract with keywords, uh, and then use lots of keywords or not lots of, but make sure to use the right keywords, I guess. And, you know, to be honest, like, I think my recollection is that we kind of joked about this in the sense that like more like in the sense that not that, that you shouldn't do it, but rather that it was kind of obvious in some way. And I would, I would say that, okay, maybe we were wrong about that. Maybe it's not that obvious. I think also, I do think that like one thing that I've learned, I think is that t- the title is actually more important than it might seem at first. Um, just because of the number of articles that like are flying by people at any given time, right? So I, I think I would agree with that. My general feeling about this article, though, was not about the specific recommendations, um, but rather just the idea that like we now rely on search engines for discovery. And, uh, and I think the issue is that if you're banking on optimizing your paper for search engines as like the road to like a successful career, um, you're in trouble. I think it's what it comes down to. Um, because it's a little bit like if you're starting a business and like you're only going to depend on your Google search engine score to like run your business, uh, it's not going to be a successful business. It's just not. First of all, Google controls everything, right? They can change anything on a whim. Um, and, and you're powerless to do anything about it, <laughs> right? So there has to be other strategies that and i think we talk about them a little bit um here and um so placing much energy at all on like optimizing your paper for google or any other search engine is like in a world of infinite time sure go for it but i just like it's not something that you should ever depend on what you're you're saying reading between the lines or being explicit is you have to have a product and a financial sustainability plan yeah right yeah yeah those those are like if you don't have those then search engine optimization is not going to cut it well you have to have a plan that doesn't rely on search you know what i mean like yeah it's like and i think that's one lesson that i've learned from like following various businesses on the internet you know it's like the ones that really depend on optimizing for search engines like they make it for a while but then something changes and then they crash so you have to have a compelling product that stands on its own, in essence. I mean, obviously, people need to learn about the product, but there are other pathways for, by which people learn about a product. Well, yeah, I mean, to borrow the phrase from the to continue this business analogy, like you need a, a like a solid go to market strategy, and it can't just depend on search engines. Um, and so you need to find a way to get these people get your work in the in front of people who are going to be either well important to you or useful to you or whatever it is. Um, and so uh, I just don't think that search engines really kind of play a big role in that. Maybe I'm wrong. I guess I'd be, I'd be glad to hear if I'm wrong. Do you think, I, I've never thought about this in terms of like how PubMed searches versus Google Scholar versus Google and how people may use, like my go-to place is PubMed, which is, and then my second go-to place is Google Scholar. Right. And that also may have something to do with why, you know, the search engine optimization, the importance of that doesn't resonate with me because I don't think it matters in sort of the PubMed world. I mean, the key words matter, right? It is a good question. I don't know to what extent like Google search is different from Google Scholar search. I mean, probably no one knows except for the people at Google, but... But whether there's any difference at all, it's I, I don't know. It's a good question. I've not heard. Right, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my f- number one stop is Google Scholar because I think I'm often looking for papers that aren't in PubMed. Uh, that's less true now than it used to be, but um, mm-hmm. th- there used to be like very few statistics journals in PubMed, uh, but now they're all there. I think. Look at that! You've you've been embraced. <laughs> um, all right, should we go on? Yes, e signatures. I don't know whether you can dig up the tweet, but you had a Twitter exchange with someone at the same time I that it I was, was Daniela Witten, if I recall. Yes. Yes. About, you know, how 
e-signatures have gotten ridiculously long. And I sort of saw that fly by and I had been independently thinking about that, but not just in terms of like the list of titles or if you have multiple offices, you have to list their addresses and, you know, gasp landline numbers and so on and so forth. But the other thing actually in e-signatures that's gotten out of hand is people have their own advertisement for, I mean, it, it, it completely ranges in what it is. Some people have like a quote of the day or of the month or whatever. That's right. just sort of a message. Some people have a fancy logo for a center or an institute or a school that they're, um, you know, affiliated with so that it's not just, you know, Roger Pang, professor of biostatistics, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, but there's like this big, Johns Hopkins Bloom of Bloomberg School of Public Health logo right. <laughs> with the tagline and <laughs> like I'm know. downloading graphics just to get your email e- now. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it seems to be a trend. You think there's a uh, e-signature inflation? That's a great phrase. Yeah. E-signature inflation is <laughs> awesome. Well, okay. So the tweet from Daniela, I'll just just to say, is, is she says academia is a war, and your only weapon is the length of your email signature. Wow, a war. So she used to have, so she's a statistician, and so she used to have that she was a professor of statistics and biostatistics in all in one line. And she changed it to professor of statistics on one line and professor of biostatistics on the next line. Wow. She's winning the war. That's called winning. Yeah, exactly. Hashtag winning. <laughs> so um, anyway, we we talked about this quite some time ago. Do you recall? No. Because, like, I mean, it was a long time ago. Because I came across, like, signature from someone. I don't even remember who it was at this point. But um, who had, like, like three different offices and put their entire, like, mailing address and fax number for each office in the signature. <laughs> fax number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that was, like, the in my mind, that person just annihilated everybody, basically. Yeah. The other thing is that does do you – just the school public health there have like a specific format that you're supposed to follow for your e-signature? Not that I'm aware of. It wouldn't surprise me if they did, but I, I, I'm not aware of it. So there's one here and I sort of painstakingly, because it's like there was color involved and I couldn't quite get the color right and specific fonts and the color only went on this part of your e-signature and I got it all set up. And then something happened where like, I, I don't, I don't know, but I got completely new email account and it all went away. <laughs> I was just like, I can't, I can't do that you again. can't do that again. Wait, so that means I can't find it? I won't be able to look it up now? My, the, the format of the e-signature? Your, yeah, your signature, yeah. No, I have one, but it doesn't adhere. Like, it's just made, like, made up. I'm like, oh. well, I guess I need to put the... <laughs> so you're you in know. violation right now. I'm in, I'm in major violation. But Ugh, the e-signature police have not come to bust me yet. <laughs> Well, the funny thing is that, like uh, in Gmail, which I use, they they often clip the signature, so you don't even see it. Ah, that's right. You get the dot dot dot. Yeah. Anyway, well, I think you're losing the war. Then maybe. Yeah. Know. Hashtag losing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next up, uh, oh, I had just one quick comment about work life balance. <laughs> wow, you're go you're going there. Well. I don't think it's particular. Well, I was just having a conversation with one of our mutual colleagues um, and about because like my son's in sixth grade and like a couple like a month ago now, he they the, his school like sent the whole sixth grade home to like quarantine because there were a couple of like COVID cases. Um, and so everyone got sent home. Everyone in his grade got sent home and they were home for like five days or something like that. And um, and so it kind of like, you know, obviously it's a major disruption and to like. Or, you know, to my work life and whatever and uh, i was talking to this colleague of ours and she was saying that like you know it's like the the co- the kind of blanket covid excuse kind of doesn't fly anymore you know like at least this is, it doesn't seem like it flies anymore in terms of like like if you can't do something oh covid you know something happened or covid related and like it seems like that's not like a blank check anymore <laughs> not i mean in a, i mean it's like it, i think i don't know i guess what i'm saying is that like People are trying to move on, you know, and, and they don't want this and they're not maybe less willing to accept this as a disruption, I guess. Right. Although 
it's clear that it's like we haven't solved all the problems, hence your son having yeah. to come home, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so it's one thing to say we don't accept it anymore because we've worked out how to deal with it so that we're right. back to it, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I don't, I don't think it flies anymore. And I, I'm not, you know, I don't have, I have kids that are out of the house. But it does seem to be happening on a regular, like I've talked to many people now who are like at some point or another, their kids were like the whole creative sent home or, you know, some large portion. So it's, it's on a regular basis now. And it's not going any, going away anytime soon. Yeah. With Omicron looming. Yeah. All right. Pet peeves. I have a pet peeve this time. This so is, I'm so excited because you never have pet peeves or you hide them. You keep them on the deep down low. <laughs> I, 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 su- I suppress them deep in my subconscious, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so one of, one of the things that I feel like is a regular occurrence on Twitter and other elsewhere, I guess, is, uh, you know, I can't believe they didn't teach me X in school. Oh, uh-huh. <laughs> where I mean it could be anything right but it's usually some real world phenomenon that occurs in like your job right like you know they didn't teach for academics it would be like what's a good example like they didn't teach you how to like do um like write a grant for example like we don't teach that uh in uh, our PhD program for example how to manage hire people I didn't teach you how to like manage yeah manage people who work for you right and uh and the list goes on because obviously the job is bigger than what you learned. Yeah. You know, well, maybe I shouldn't say obviously, but but the job is bigger uh, than the than whatever it is you learn in school. Any job is bigger than like the skills that you learn, you know, in, in an educational setting. And um, I just it, I always because anyway, my point is that it, it always it brings back the concept of the time pie, right? Which is that there's always a call for more curriculum, but while simultaneously a call for that curriculum should take less time <laughs> right like like there's like a call for more curriculum but also why does school last so long why like why are people in school for so long right right and uh i'm still like i feel like if someone can can like thread that needle there's like multiple nobel prizes at stake here <laughs> well you know, people in medical education have tried to thread that needle how so so traditionally medical school is four years and traditionally the first two years are all didactic and towards the end of your second year, you start to get, you may have like a clinical skills course where you're p- prepared to do your clinical rotations in your third and fourth year. And so maybe, I don't know how long ago, but a while ago, I, and I don't, it may not be Duke, I may be misremembering, but there was a medical school that said, we're going to compress the first two years into a one year. And people are going to go into, you know, their clinical rotations in their second year. And then we're going to have an extra year for sort of other activities. And I I don't know what they are at this other school, but the medical school here has adopted that. And so the clinical rotations happen in the second year. And during the third year, Students can either spend the year doing research, they could spend the year getting a variety of master's degrees, like an MPH or an MBA or a master's of public policy, um, public affairs, Um, and then they go back and do, you know, they have some little bit of clinic longitudinally during their third year, and then they do clinical, go back into the clinical world their fourth year full time. And I, I actually don't know enough about it to say whether, quote unquote, it's a success or not. And I'm sure you could find people on, you know, either side of the issue who say that, um, you know, that you've sacrificed sort of this critical learning in the first two years about underlying pathophysiology and, and making connections between, you know, having more breadth of knowledge so that you can make connections between what you see in a human being and, you know, what you've learned about pathophysiology. And, um, and then other people have probably said, you know, well, you didn't need, you know, you didn't need to understand the Krebs cycle, which is a classic thing that people talk about, you know, in order to take care of this kind of patient. And this gives people an opportunity to broaden what they know in a different direction. But the point is people have tried it, but, they've clearly had to sacrifice and it's just an argument about like whether what got sacrificed 
you know, was worth the sacrifice for whatever, you know, it got replaced by, with. Well, it, <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, it only works if you do sacrifice, right? So, I mean, it only has a chance of working, let's just say, if you sacrifice. Because I think if you don't, then you're just compressing a ton of material into a shorter amount of time. And that is just a recipe for stressing everyone out, like, in a big way. Um, and... I feel like I've been in debates over curriculum since the day I got here, basically, which I think in the grand scheme of things is a good indicator, right? It's it's an indicator that, like, the field is active, you know, in some sense, right, uh, and evolving and, and that you're aware of that. Um, but it's always it's always been a challenge. And I think it's – and I think it's hard to kind of – may draw a line between like what is it you're supposed to learn in the classroom and what is it that you're supposed to learn somewhere else and i think many people feel like i i had to learn this so therefore everyone should have to learn it and therefore it should be in the classroom right anyway i just uh <laughs> it's a, my point is that it's a harder problem than it looks like yes and and i think there actually are sort of creative ways to get at it which is that the things that don't fit into the curriculum of some formal degree program. Um, and I think they're, you know, universities offer this sort of thing, um, can be taught or there can be opportunities for sort of more formal structured learning after you have your job, right? I mean, you can sign up for professional development opportunities to talk about like how to hire or manage people. But Yeah. And then I think the, the issue there is that you just have to set that expectation because I think people are like, why am I having to sign up for this professional development thing? I should have learned it in school. Oh, right. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, well, you know, you can't learn everything in school. At least not in a finite amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some things, I would argue, are much better learned hand in hand while you're doing them. In, in, other, in other words, like, does it make sense to have a course on hiring someone as a part of a PhD curriculum. Right. I, or, or managing people, you know, when you're not actually managing them. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's, that's sort of my point. It's just, it's too abstract, you know? Um, and so it, it's, it, it could be, it's hard to kind of figure out, well, when's the right moment to do that. And also I think that like, at least for like statistics, maybe less so for you, it's like not that every, like everyone does that. Um, so it's, it, it is a balance to strike in terms of like what is the core of a given field? What is what are the few things that like everyone needs to know in order to call themselves a statistician? Um, and so we, it, it, it's so it's an ongoing debate, I think. And uh, but it's uh, anyway, it always makes me smile when I see it on, on Twitter. So you, the, yeah, that's the other trademark you have is like your pet peeves amuse <laughs> you rather than aggravate you. Yeah, I guess that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's really, really in your subconscious. Like you are really good at suppressing this sort of, these That's right. sorts of negative feelings. Yeah, it's like seven levels down. Yeah. All right, Rogers Leadership Academy. Yes. I have the first one, which is avoid face-to-face -face meetings at all costs. So, uh, yes. Okay. Basically, you kind of don't want to have to face people, right? It's so the, the and maybe. Face-to-face -face social, work social gatherings, yes. Uh, okay. Face-to-face -face meetings, no. You want to avoid those because, you know, inevitably there's some contentious issue and you can be put on the spot where as if you control sort of the communication, like by email where it's asynchronous, or you have someone else sort of do the communicating, then you can avoid kind of being cornered in a kind of more public way, uncomfortable way. <laughs> That's excellent advice, actually. Yeah. 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 Is that it? That's it. All right. I've actually got one this time, which is, a, it's a, you know, it's unusual to be to be speaking in my own academy, I think. <laughs> That's right. But uh, I've came across, so this one is um, collect, or, or I should say, yeah, uh, compile, or I should say, I should say ask for feedback from the group or whatever number of people you're you're asking for them, and then and then offer to compile and interpret it to your own benefit. You see, and you see this all the time. You know, I, 
I guess I do, but it's like I never occurred to me until recently. So, so, so I, the I, the idea would be like, ask for feedback. Everyone complains about something. And maybe there are a few good things. And then you say, okay, well, I've taken everybody's feedback, and here's the do- a document summarizing what people said. And then, and then it's like you have enormous freedom to just, you know, <laughs> write whatever you want here. So it's like these people thought this was great, and there were a couple of complaints about this other thing here. I, I've seen this in spades, right? Institutions do this. Yes. Where they'll like yes. send out like a climate survey and – and then you get the report and you're like, there's nothing but fluff here. Right. <laughs> like, what's the point of sending out a survey unless like you want to hear the criticism and sort of pause and thought, thoughtfully evaluate it and figure out whether, you know, what you should be doing differently. And the reports all, are always these. I mean, they're electronic, but they're very slick. They tend to be like pie charts, right? Um, and they may slip in some sort of negative stuff there, but it's stuff that's like barely negative and, you know, it's cloaked in something like, oh yes, there's more stress because of COVID, like externalizing the fault that, you know, the blame. Well, that's the lesson from the last episode. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Um, and you just, you just gotta, I mean, this is one where when I get these, I just laugh because I'm like, there's nothing useful here. <laughs> I mean, maybe there was behind the scenes, but it probably was not put to good use. And it's certainly, there's like this kind of patina of transparency, which is exactly that, just the patina of transparency. Yeah. Well, there is like a Machiavellian kind of angle to this, right? That is potentially usable, which is Mm -hmm. that like, I think people tend to shy from taking certain leadership positions because it's like it's going to be a pain in the butt and like you're going to have to like do a lot of work (laughs) like that's not related to other stuff that you want to do um but it is an opportunity to do exactly this right is to shepherd the process and interpret it to your benefit yes well i think there's another there's a nuance maybe you may be getting at which is that if you like taking, I think what you're saying is that if you have some specific agenda, yes, let's say you want more funds to go towards supporting teaching as an activity, and you get into that position, you can stack the deck of that survey so that teaching is highlighted as a place that really needs a lot of investment. Well, even if you don't stack the deck, uh, you, if you're the person responsible for like interpreting the results and and you know and writing the report or whatever, right? Because that's the other thing. Usually, nobody is jumping up to write the report, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like nobody wants to do that. Let's say you're on a committee or something like that, right? Like nobody wants to be responsible for like a fi- or for writing the final report. And so, so you're not going to have a lot of competition, you know, to do this job. Um, and so now you can just write whatever you want, right? And then you then you go and you say, look, there's this big gap in education that yeah. needs addressing. Yeah, these are the power moves of academia. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Let me know next time you put that into motion. <laughs> I have never, to my knowledge, uh, availed myself of this kind of tactic. Yeah. Because it also seems like a lot of work. Yeah, I'm <laughs> exhausted just thinking about it. <laughs> well, and if you pair it with avoiding face-to-face meetings, then no one will ever... You know, you avoid being confronted about it. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. This is like, just like there's a Swiss cheese approach to COVID mitigation. There's like a Swiss cheese approach approach to leadership. Like you have to like, (laughs) you have to implement all of these things. Yes. It's not, it's a multi-dimensional, multi-factor type of approach. Right. Right. All right. We have a couple of topics for today. I think these are all mine. So I'm going to, what I'd like to start out with is a grant writing one. I myself have personally experienced this recently, and I've also observed others experience this, which is that the, like the methods part of grants are really hard. Not the, oh, this is how I'm going to measure lung function, or, you know, this is what I'm going to, how I'm going to prepare the spleen samples from mice or whatever. Not, not that sort of technical kind of um, mechanical piece of things, but 
the overall sort of approach or strategy is really hard. And in fact, you and I were just having a conversation before we started recording about like, well, this is the research question. What, what, what is the design? And does that map back to a, um, an equation or an analysis plan? And um, what has happened to me, and, and I've seen it happen to others, is that you get so mired in the how part of the grant at some point in time in the evolution of writing it that you forget about the why, which is the significance part of it, right? And the potential impact. And then you can undersell the significance part of it and the impact because you can be lulled into the sense of like, oh, I came up with this brilliant randomized clinical trial design. This is so awesome for answering the question. Right. And you get swept away by that you submit the grant and then, you know, you realize, oh, well, I didn't really sell the impact and the importance of the research question. Does this resonate with you or? Is this- well, I mean, this happens all the time, I think, in uh, in like statistics types of such, uh, applications because there's always this focus on like, let's, let's build our fancy model, right, uh, with like little attention paid to like either what the problem is being solved or whether the problem is kind of framed properly or whether it's like an interesting problem or, uh, or whether we even bother to mention the problem. (laughs) Right, Um, right, right. right. I think, I think the issue there might be a little bit different because sometimes it's like, I just wanted to like build my fancy model and, uh, I don't care if it's really like a good fit for this problem. Um, but sometimes it's like what you said, like you, you kind of forget about the problem and you focus all your time on like the, the methods part. Um, and then, but then you don't sell the significance. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have anything particularly profound to say about it, except for that, um, been there, done that. I find myself many times in kind of mock study sections or, you know, giving people feedback, asking about the why, um, because they've been in the same place I have, which is sort of hand wringing about like, well, oh my gosh, it turns out I need a thousand patients with asthma or whatever, you know, I need to figure out a recruitment plan or go get letters from people. And then you forget about sort of the why piece of things. And so I find myself, and this is a bit over the top, but I think if you can imagine when you're writing your grant, it's being reviewed alongside a whole cast of other grant characters And it's being reviewed alongside another grant that is basically saying, oh, we've, you know, found a cure for cancer, Mm -hmm. which is an over the top sort of thing, but it illustrates in very stark terms. Okay, well, I'm proposing this grant that where I'm going to develop this fun, fancy model, but I'm not really sure even what the application is. And (laughs) I think that that sort of illustrates the problem. All right. All right. So I think this is a good segue to the next main topic, which is the different distinction between selling an idea and sort of substance or selling something that has evidence to back it. Okay. And this gets back to this tension between the how and the why. I'm sure I'll get pushed back about this, but when I interact with people in the private sector, And to some extent, some people are really good at this in academia. There's a lot of emphasis on sort of the why and the impact Um, and because they're selling an idea. And sometimes it's the same way, like if there's a potential donor, for example, um, you're selling an idea to them. You're not selling the sort of like how and um, they have to believe that the idea is a good one. But beyond that, you know, you, there, you don't need like substance beyond that generally, or you need less substance. And um, I think I have under appreciated the value of the selling of the idea part of things, because there's like an entire private sector world that runs entirely on selling an idea and people just move from one failed idea to another or they sell it and it morphs into something else that's much more mundane. Um, and I know, you know, I've like had to present before to like a family foundation for a grant idea and 
just in retrospect, right, I was so focused on demonstrating feasibility and that I really had the exact kind of expertise to do this and that the preliminary data was really strong um, and, again, overlooked this need um, that the audience had for kind of like, oh, this is going to change entirely how we take care of kids with asthma for the better. So are you saying that, if I, if I, if I hear you correctly, that we should be thinking about that more? <laughs> I, I think so. I mean, it makes me uncomfortable, to be to be honest. And I don't know whether it makes me uncomfortable because science is not supposed to be that way combined with a little bit of like, I don't know whether it's um, imposter syndrome, but like I have this personal sense of like, well, I need to kind of justify and prove things and demonstrate things to people. Right. And that, and that the way that I demonstrate it, like that, I, I feel like I'm being not entirely transparent if I just go in there and pitch some idea with less substance to back it. Like, I feel like somewhat of a fraud, kind of. I have this feeling of like, oh, this doesn't feel good to be this way. So I'm not suggesting <laughs> that we be that way entirely, but you could go through all the think thought process of the substance and the feasibility and the evidence, but take a moment to pause about how you package that and present that to the audience. And obviously, even for study sections, because of what we just talked about, there's there's the selling of the idea part that's really important. Yeah. And I guess there's a question of like, should everyone be doing this? Um, and I, part of me feels like I want to be able to say, like, if it makes you uncomfortable, then, then don't do it. But if you but, but then you have to kind of accept the fact that you're going to be in a certain kind of role in academia, I suppose. Right. I mean, I think um, there are people who don't do this at all. Um, and uh, and they, they seem to have decent careers, I suppose. Do you think do you think this has become more and more important or playing a bigger role? in academia than over time? I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to say. I do think, though, that it's hard for people. You know, I think, like, I feel like my the way I see it is, like, in the commercial world, you know, there's kind of this distinction between a technology and a product. Um, and many people work on a technology, um, but they can't sell it because nobody wants the technology. They want a product, right? Like nobody wants to buy Wi-Fi. They want to buy a phone, right? It's easy to kind of get caught up in like, this is a great technology. It's going to solve so many problems, right? But uh, if you don't, you know, actually have something that, if you don't produce something that actually solves a person's like need or like kind of satisfies a person's needs, then like no matter, it doesn't matter how good the technology is, right? And I think like, for example, in statistics, we often build like what we think are better models or better designs, things like that. Um, but when it comes to solving the actual, so that's good for like, you know, doing a study or analyzing the data but if you go one level up and say well what's going to take to solve this problem like often what's hard to admit is that like your statistical model isn't really going to be a big a big factor <laughs> like in solving like i don't know improving the over morbidity of people with some disease right um it may be a big factor in a component of the evidence right you know and i think so that's good but it can be hard to admit that like well there's many factors that's going to play into like improving people with a certain disease I think there, there are two levels of this selling the idea. There's one level, which is the substance is all there. And it's just important to pause and think about packaging and selling the idea. And then there's another level, which is that you've overhyped beyond what the substance supports. If that, if that, uh, right. Yes. And, and I think there's a distinction between those two things where I think um, everyone can benefit from pausing and saying, okay, is this going to solve a problem? What's the problem? And I need to make sure to highlight that. That's like really important um, when I'm trying to get funding or um, have people adopt this idea and implement it. Cause I think it's actually going to be, you know, very helpful to people and solve a problem in a meaningful way versus like 
really you're doing a bunch of hand waving and there's not much there to package up, but you're selling that, you know, the latest technology is going to, you know, cure brain tumors or something like that. But right. You, have, <laughs> you don't have firm ground to stand on. Just to be clear, we're saying you should do that, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, should we? Well, I do think that if... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm if, kidding. Well, in terms of the, the... You mentioned the trends over time. I do think that if there's kind of less money to go around, then this will increase, right? Well, and there are more platforms for it. Like, I, it seems like people in the biomedical science world, even pre-COVID, but definitely since COVID, in part because of Twitter and other platforms, there are places to promote yourself. And I think... This idea about selling an idea is tied closely to like, you know, promoting oneself. Uh, uh, promoting your brand. Yeah. 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 How's your brand doing these days? Oh, my gosh. I saw something on Twitter where you're supposed to quote tweet your, I guess, background picture to highlight your brand. Like, I don't even know what, what half that means. I mean, I kind <laughs> of do. but I don't even remember what my bra- background photo is like. Anyway, I, that's where I feel really uncomfortable about like having a brand that you're promoting. Just like, what is that? Your background photo looks like a, a river with a sunset. Oh, that's in our neighborhood. Okay. I, maybe, or that's like, I don't know if that's your background photo or your like banner photo. Anyway, you could use, you could use the effort report logo if you want. You should, you, you should quote tweet, tweet that and like, you know, that's my brand. Point. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What's your brand? My brand is on the dec- on the decline. I think it's uh it's not very good right now. I don't even like. What does that mean? My influencer status is is just like at rock bottom. I think I have no influence. Are all the Russian bots no longer following you? <laughs> no, I think they're the, those are the only ones I have left. What are you that talking about? The only one. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was all all, all your followers, hundred <laughs> percent bots. Yeah, I I'm, I I serve the bots. You know, I'm at their. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, I don't know what to say. <laughs> should we, should we move on to the other main topic? Yes, let's do it. I, I'm curious to hear what this one is. I know. Well, this may not play well. Do you find yourself sometimes serving as the glue for a group? I mean, professionally, not that like, you know, your poker club or whatever. Um, I don't know. I don't know what this means. You don't know what this means. Not exactly. So when there's like one person who, like if that person were to stop initiating activities or meetings or whatever, the the group would just fall, you know, would maybe not immediately fall apart, but that you're the one person that's sort of at, at the hub that is keeping everyone glued together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see what you mean. I don't think I am this person ever. <laughs> I don't think you are either. So. No. I think I might so. subconsciously avoid being that person. <laughs> so I think I'm this person a lot. Yes. So I was just kind of thinking about and and I don't know whether I... It sounds like you've chosen not to be the glue deliberately. <laughs> like the person who's kind of like holding everything together with their bare hands. Well, no, that you've chosen not to be that person. Yes. That's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. And you've been deliberate about that. Yes. So you're available if people come knocking on your door. But the emotional and mental energy to try to like organize people or get them together or to have a conversation with a group of people, that's not you. Right. I'll comment on that in a second. Okay. Well, you can go ahead and comment on that. No, I mean, I think it's just, uh, I think I have made that choice and it has pluses and minuses like everything else, (laughs) right? It's like a trade-off when it comes down to. I think one of the things that, I guess maybe my my, one question for you is like, what's the difference between like this person, the glue, and then like a leader? Oh, yeah. I found myself asking myself that question too. And I would prefer to be the glue and not the leader, <laughs> oh. but it could, it, it could be, it could be that the glue is sort of a leader in disguise. Yeah. Well, sometimes the glue is like the Lieutenant leader, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which can be good or bad. It depends. But, um, 
Yeah. I, I think my issue is that like, I think if you're, if you avoid this kind of thing, then I think it limits the kind of the, the scale of, of things that would, you can do, you know? Um, and, uh, and you have to be okay with that. Right. Right. Whereas any activity or any kind of project that goes beyond a certain scale, like has to kind of bring together a lot of people and kind of keep them running or going or so, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and so you have to be able to do that. And so do you, is it helpful to make sure that you're aligned with some glue people <laughs> if you're not a glue person? I guess so. Yeah. Like, well, but then what's the difference? Like if you're managing the glue people. <laughs> well, no, I'm not, you're not managing, not managing them, but you're but like, there, yeah. that you're sort of like, okay, there's this sort of larger platform that I could be a part of, but I don't have to be, put the energy in to sort of like, I'm part of the team because this person who's a glue person, okay, like this episode is just completely fallen apart. <laughs> it's just like one half baked idea after another. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow. I, am I making sense? Like if you, if you are not a glue person, but yet you have, you know, are on good terms and aligned with the glue person, they'll bring you along for the ride. Yes. Yes, that's true. I think, you know, I think anytime you have a group of people, right? Let's say beyond five or six, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think we can all agree that there's some, there's always people who do d disproportionately more work than others, right? Right. Uh, I feel like that's been true in any group I've ever been in, <laughs> any work-related group, right? So we're going back to the per Pareto whatever principle. Prin yeah, right. Yeah. And so those people are the glue, right? They they move everything along. Otherwise, there would be no movement at all. Right. Yeah. So this gets to my question, like, should I stop being a glue person? Well, do you think you're getting anything out of it? Um, I haven't really kind of sat down in that way to kind of like, take an accounting of what I'm what I think it probably depends on each different activity that I'm the glue person for it, it may be hard to quantify or even characterize right um, right which is the problem I think but right and also the benefits may be long in the future or the perceived benefits may be long in the future right right I do enjoy like uh the community that it creates I will say that for many of the things that I've been involved in. Well, I <laughs> I could well I could I could present to you the uh counterfactual, you know, scenario, right? Okay. Which go is ahead. me, right? Yeah. And uh so if you want to end up like me, you know, there's your choice. That's not you know, that that's a pretty good deal. You're like, I don't know if I want that. <laughs> I don't know whether what I do could be successful like that. Probably like inherently not. what I do requires multidisciplinary collaboration. Yeah. I mean, you'd have to learn a lot more of the Greek alphabet to be me, like me. I'm learning. Oh, no. There's like a whole, the world's being trained to be statisticians. Exactly. <laughs> Bring on the equations with the Greek letters. We were talking the other day about how actually we never use Omicron and, and I've never used Omicron, the letter. Right. Um, in any paper and like I use plenty of other Greek letters and someone made a comment that's like, if you're reading a paper that uses Omicron, like that's not a paper you want to read. <laughs> <laughs> and to, just to be clear about what that means is that like, if you're using Omicron, it's because you've like used up all the other Greek letters <laughs> and like now you're just like scrambling for like whatever Greek letters happen to be remaining. So that just means that there's a lot of mathematical notation in that paper. So run for your life. Yes. <laughs> so, but I'll tell you now, I think there's going to be like a, a renaissance in Omicron used in the, in mathematical papers now. There might be. And what I learned via Twitter, which would have, should have been obvious, but like it's O micron and then O mega, like little O and big O. Oh, okay. Wait. Low, yeah. But Omega is not an O. I don't know. Maybe Twitter was, was, you know. Not a good source. I don't know anything about the Greek alphabet. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the take-home message is I have to continue to be the glue. Well, uh, you don't have to do anything, right? Well, that's true. But being a glue is an important part of the work that I do. Okay. But I don't have to be the glue in all circumstances. Yes. You can You can hang back a little if you want. Yeah. Right. No one's going to judge do you. Know you. What, do you know what got me thinking about this? What? 
So we have our like uh, facilitated peer mentoring group, which is the formal term for us just getting together once a month to chat about stuff. Yes. And there are just four of us. And I think I was the one who initiated the group way back when. Were you? Yes. Okay. I barely remember. Okay. But I continue to be, and it's got to, it, it, I don't know if it's been a decade, but it's got to be close to a decade. If not, I am the one who um, does the, coordinates the scheduling of it. That is true. Yes. And that's a glue thing to do. Well, okay. But in this kind of situation, right? I think it makes the most logical sense for the person who has like the most restricted schedule <laughs> to, to drive the scheduling. Okay, okay. Fair enough, but it was like that before though. And so then I went through a thought exercise of like there are three other members of the group besides me. So yes. you're one of them. And then there are two others. And I wondered if I if this task of scheduling was left up to the other any of the others in the group what would happen ah yes we would just we would abandon it basically (laughs) i think it might happen that way but the but people value the group which is just fascinating to me yes i think we've delegated our you know leadership to you ah okay it's been it was an act of delegation oh that's what i that's what i concluded (laughs) it is true no you're totally right and I think, it, it, yeah, I think I, maybe there's some like research on like group dynamics that we're, you know, that we should look into in terms of like how they, the groups like self-organize and like leadership emerges, a glue emerges perhaps, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. should look into that. It might explain a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Any, uh, anything else? That's enough. That's enough. We've like... <laughs> For those people still hanging it's in there. It's been a brutal episode. Absolutely brutal. Yeah. Weekly weekly grind. Yes. Hold on a second. I'll just kind of punch in the... Yeah, I'm de- carefully keeping track of the time codes here. That's, that's how busy Look I at am. you being yeah. the glue. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the glue of this podcast. I have to say, I believe I'm... Not the not this podcast, but of my other podcast. <laughs> oh, you're the glue of your other podcast? Yes. I, I, I think you're, you, there's some glue role you have for this one, too. A little bit, but... And, but and you know why you've why? been forced to do it because um, there's a skill and sort of work that needs to be done that I don't know how to do. True, but I also I would argue. <laughs> well, now that we're extending this topic, um, you know, I, I this is something that I want to do, right? right? So I'm happy to glue it together. Good. Well, thank you then. Um, but maybe, but what I've done is I've like radically prioritize what are the things that I want to do. Uh, and so therefore I'm not always, I'm not often the glue of certain activities. Right. That's my hypothesis. All right. Now back to the weekly grind. Yes. So, you know what I did this week, which, uh, which I haven't done in a while actually <laughs> is grading. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, usually the TA is great, but you didn't, you didn't stick those bubble things in through the Scantron. No, that's not how we do it these days. <laughs> Really? I, I was grading data analyses, so these were like reports. Did you get it all done? It's all done. Yeah, at least for now. There's always something next, you know. Right, right. I um, had an interview with um, a reporter for the Daily Texan, and the Daily Texan is the UT Austin newspaper. Oh, ah, okay. I feel like this is not, not the first time you've done this. It's not. Have I said it for the weekly grind before? I, I feel, it sounds familiar. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, it's fine. You know, it's, if you're doing it all the time, then, you know. Maybe. Well, so it's fascinating because I'm sure there's an undergrad newspaper at Hopkins. I, I'm sure there is. But Yes. I actually, it, it, I'm like embarrassed to say that I don't know the name of it. Right. But this, the Daily Texan folks, they like... They email the comms team at the medical school and they're like, we want to talk to Dr. So-and-so. Um, and it's anyway, I've just been impressed with like the degree of engagement, you know, um, and, you know, m- most of these, the editor in chief will go on to like, you know, a journalism career, um, you know, at sometimes some of the one of the newspapers in texas or elsewhere and so it 
seems to be like an impressive organization and operation. I'm sure it is. Yeah. What were you talking about? The, uh, so I had a paper, our group had a paper that came out that was like spatial modeling of asthma ED visits in Travis ah. County. So there was like a ton of interest because this was a local analysis. It, it was a very like community focused, right. Analysis. And because there hadn't been that kind of work that's ever been done here. Um, I think it just resonated. So there was other media too, as well as the, uh, UT Austin newspaper. All right. It was kind of fun. All right. I think that's a wrap. <laughs> you can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at the effort report and you can email us. Our Gmail email address is the effort report at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for listening.